and he took took my parents into the room and said it might be a mutated gene and when i heard that i'm like oh cool i'm an x men you know cuz x men have powers <laughs> after 31 years of not knowing what it was then i got the diagnosis because they were just not ready to you know even agree that let's check if there is something 3 2 1 here we go welcome to inside out with somia today i have two guest speakers who live with rare health conditions which has and does continue to play a central role in their lives we're here today to talk about their life experience of living with these rare conditions we'll be covering three broad aspects in this conversations including their personal journey of diagnosis and treatment their emotional and psychological impact and the way to build resources and support and for that the first speaker i have today is alma who is an ataxia fighter she is a disability awareness activist to a life coach and a motivational speaker and i just realized also a yoga enthusiast at this slide that in <laughs> her mission is to create a society where all individuals have equal access to their rights and opportunities fostering inclusivity empowerment especially for the differently challenged so thank you and welcome alma for coming here today and also introducing the second guest speaker madhumita who is a counseling psychologist with 11 plus years of experience more than a decade she specializes in counseling for chronic and rare diseases both for patients and caregivers she has also worked with various national and internationally reputed organizations she is currently working with several organizations including cloud nine hospitals in bangalore and the organization for rare disease india so welcome both of you how are you doing this evening doing well it's about summer is about to begin so bringing in the summer with a very exciting conversation thanks somya for having us here today <laughs> thank you so much somya for having me today you know as uh, alma mentioned that summers are have started but it just feels like may june in bangalore you know so it, it's it's just too difficult to manage but yeah i'm doing good and looking forward to having an interesting conversation with you and alma today on rare disease likewise so let's dive right into it and because we're talking about rare health conditions assuming that not a lot of people know for anyone who already knows kudos to you but for the viewers who might not know how about we just dive in and explain the conditions that you both have sure okay um so my mama um i was diagnosed with cerebellar ataxia ataxia is um it's not really a disease in itself ataxia is usually a symptom of of an overlying disease or a trauma so when you have spinal cord injury you have ataxia when you have um multiple sclerosis you have symptoms of ataxia when you have muscular dystrophy you have ataxia when you have parkinson's you have ataxia so ataxia is more they say you have ataxic symptoms you have ataxic gait So ataxia is more like an adjective rather than a noun. However, as a, however, as a disease, um, ataxia is most well known for being genetic. Um, and in the genetic family, the most commonly known form of ataxia is Friedrichs. Um, that's still very uncommon. Uh, less than I think less. Than, I would say less than. 2% of the world population have uh um that form of genetic ataxia. Um I um am lucky enough to have spinal cerebellar ataxia which is um is very rare because there is no there is no prognosis meaning um in my case we don't uh, when i was diagnosed doctors didn't know what uh, what to treatment to give me how i would end up um and there's no etiology meaning there is no um no one knew where it came from 
high fevers, some kind of injury. Um, you know, I didn't have any underlying problem or genetic issue. So um, we didn't know, uh, you know, where, where my, I guess my condition was going to leave me. Mm -hmm. um, so that's generally about attacks. Yeah, it's a still very kind of um, an anomaly. Um, it's coming up. I mean, it's becoming a little more popular as awareness builds um, really throughout the world. But um, I, I would say 10 years ago, no one even knew how to spell ataxia. Now, if you go in hospitals, at least doctors know what ataxia is. So mm. it's a little bit reassuring. Yeah, I am already hearing some similarities with Madhumita's story as I've heard of it. But I'll, of course, invite Madhumita to speak about yours also. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, I, I completely agree with Alma, you know, 10 years back, nobody knew what is a rare disease. And just to give a brief about what a rare disease is, so a rare disease is a condition where uh, you have a limited number of people per lack of birth, okay? And that makes it so difficult that you don't have many patients, you don't have many people suffering from one particular condition. So research, treatment, you know, knowing, finding a uh, medicine, all of that becomes very difficult. And since all these research in itself is difficult, so there's no cure which can come out so easily. So, so Samita syndrome is basically a condition which involves both your heart and lung, okay? So typically, whenever I see somebody that I have a condition which involves my heart, the frequent, uh, the comment that I get is, okay, is it a hole in the heart? But no, mm -hmm. it's not a hole in the heart. It could be one of the symptoms of the metal syndrome. So it's basically a syndrome, which means there are multiple things which are, uh, mm -hmm. so which are happening, not exactly how it should happen in your body, right? So to very briefly tell what Sumita syndrome is, it's basically a condition where the main artery which supplies blood to the lung, mostly the right lung, that's non-functional. So your blood doesn't reach the right lung in the usual way it should, right? As a result, the body creates another artery. Mm -hmm. And it could be from anywhere, anywhere from your heart chambers, anywhere from the other major, uh, you know, arteries in the body, okay? So that supplies the uh, blood to the lung. And then after this lung uh, purifies the blood again, the blood doesn't reach back to the heart in the usual place it should, okay? Mm -hmm. So it reaches somewhere else. So in my case, uh, I don't have a pulmonary artery which supplies the lung with the blood. So my right lung is collapsed. It's very small uh, and only probably one lobe of the lung was working until two years back. And after the lung purified, the blood used to go and mix with the deoxygenated blood, which is being you know collected from your entire lower body and reaches the heart. So it gets mm -hmm. mixed up. The oxygenated blood gets mixed up with the deoxygenated blood, mm -hmm. creating a loop which was of no use. And it mm -hmm. was constantly putting a pressure on my heart, on my lung. Uh, and this is just one part of the problem. So there are with people with Simita syndrome, they could experience different kinds of problems, different organs being involved in it. Even if it is heart, there are different uh, you know issues that could come up where mm -hmm. you could have, you know, a hole in the heart or uh, a shunting that is happening wherein the blood supply is not proper. So every person with the condition is different. And Got it. It, so you can just understand, you know, how difficult it is also for the medical, you know, providers, healthcare providers, mm -hmm. to even understand what your body is going through and what exactly do you need? Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, so thank you for giving me and everyone else a brief of the condition that you both live with. And I'm wondering, so like Madhu, you were sharing how there were early indicators of something that's supposed to happen in, happen in certain ways not happening, right? Because mm-hmm. with both of your conditions, I'm assuming that it's not something like diabetes that you run a test and you find out what's up and down. Yeah, it's very hard to actually get to know what exactly is going on. So tell me more about what was happening or being observed differently with you that helped you your family to get some help and understand the condition more or even go to a place where you can get a diagnosis of what's happening right so i mean to start with as i was saying that you know it started so many years back where a simple a couple of bouts of cuff and cold led to you know me spitting up blood and then my parents rushing to the hospital. So when they went back to the hospital the second time, so that's when the doctor started running the test, right? Mm -hmm. So they did an x-ray and that showed that my right lung is collapsed and it's not working, okay? And while they were also checking me with the stethoscope, they found they could not find the heartbeat in the left side of my chest. Okay, and they were like, yeah. okay. and in a three-month-old baby, it, it's very difficult to find out what is the left, what is the right, right? So uh, they eventually found that the heartbeat was more prominent towards the right. And when they did the x-ray, so they found that uh, I have dextrocardia as well. So they thought that it was dextrocardia again. So there were a lot of, you know, confusions around Which is what? what it is. So dextrocardia is when your heart is shifted to the right side, when your heart is located Mm. to the right side. Now, again, there could be many variations. Scimitar syndrome can come up with dextrocardia. So dextrocardia is a sign of it as well. But later on, like much later, I would say, it was finally understood that it's not that my heart is completely located to the right. But because I have a very small right lung, so that empty space, that is something which is taken up by the heart. So my heart is shifted mm-hmm. to the right side. Okay. And uh, and all so, of this is testing is going on on a few months young baby. Young baby, yes. Uh-huh. So years passed. I was constantly on treatment for the right lung hypoplasia. So what yeah. would happen is I would frequently get cup and cold, very high fever uh, to an extent like Every month, probably, I would be down with fever of 100, 405 uh, degrees uh, for 15, 20 days. 405? Yeah, yeah. So for 15, 20 days in a month. And that has been there throughout my childhood. Mm-hmm. Until I I was in my teenage. So mm-hmm. slowly the fe- fever came down. Bouts of fever came down. But cough and cold had continued. Like, for as long as I can remember. Uh, it was only in 2019 uh, when I finally got my diagnosis of scimitar syndrome. Mm. So spent these many years of my life without knowing that I have a scimitar syndrome, but just a part of it was known. Yeah, so, just a part of it. And I, you smile today and you say that, but... I can really only imagine what it must be like to pass all of those years struggling, not knowing what the hell is happening. Mm-hmm. I mean, I would say, Samia, that this, this con- you know, thing started in 2018 when I started really feeling this because until that point, I knew that only, this is the only thing that I have. Mm. Right? I had no clue of the actual complete yeah. picture of the condition and yeah. it really came down as a shock after 31 years that okay I just knew part 31 of years this. yeah part mm-hmm. of this but there's a lot of it actually to the entire condition which we weren't aware of absolutely yeah I, and I want to probe more into that and before that I also want to ask Alma what has your experience been growing up what symptoms did you and your loved ones notice around you that pushed you to seek a diagnosis or just go to doctors? 
Well, um, my diagnosis journey was a little bit different. I was, I didn't have any um, problems at birth or in early childhood. I was diagnosed when I was 10 years old. So I was a very robust athlete, I, um, including a gymnast. Um, yeah. Did it 11 I, years, you say? 11 years? I was diagnosed at 11. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, at 10, 10, 10 I was diagnosed. Um, and like I was a gymnast when I was when I was growing up until the age of eight or nine or even ten and I remember it was like I think my diagnosis didn't even start with me feeling anything yeah I had some aches and headaches as a childhood and high fevers which may have been a symptom or a sign of that something was wrong but um, I think at age seven or eight, we started noticing that I was just was standing. I was like, kind of, it's like, um, you know, when you go to a rave and uh, people use their phones, mm -hmm. but, like I used to sway like that, you know, very subtly though. And, but mind you, during this time, I was a gymnast um, and such a gymnast that I was uh, practicing with the girls from the U.S. Junior Olympic team. And then juxtapose that with being um, diagnosed with a condition that is very opposite to who mm -hmm. you are innately, right? So I used to do cartwheels off of the balance beam, which is like three to like three feet off the ground. And yeah. I remember after being diagnosed, I went into the um, gymnasium and I tried doing a somersault, which was like a left-hand thing for gymnasts off of like the balance beam that was one inch off the ground. And I, I was having trouble landing just a somersault in, in like, you know, in a straight line. So it was kind of, my condition came up, I think it was more psychological because it was mm. like, you know, one day you're a full-fledged gymnast, two days later you're diagnosed, four days later you come back to the gym and you're, t you're totally like, you can't operate anything in the gymnasium. Yeah. So I think it was uh, kind of psychological, you know, that um, all of a sudden I wasn't able to do any balancing kind of activities within the gym um but um I was very positive and I was in extreme denial when I was diagnosed um <laughs> and you I, were also just 10 years young so <laughs> yeah I know I remember when my um what my neurologist my main neurologist he um spoke to my parents after um like they were talking about the possibilities. Like we we gave him my whole genetic tree and ruled out that I was genetic. And he took took my parents into the room and said, it might be a mutated gene. And when I heard that, I'm like, oh, cool. I'm an X-Men, you know, because X-Men have power. <laughs> so it's, it speaks it's, about the creative power of kids. <laughs> yeah, definitely. It definitely does. And I think... um. I think coming at coming to the diagnosis with um that kind of psychology with um even though it was denial, that kind of positivity put me in, in the place where I am today, where mm -hmm. I can um I can say I've overcome so many hurdles within Ataxia that so many people can't because that positivity was kind yeah. of hammered in at such an early age. Absolutely. Yeah, that, that sounds so wonderful. And um, so it sounds like your the journey of your diagnosis was pretty quick and smooth. Like your parents, who who observed that you would sway a little? And then it was definitely my parents, more my mom. Mm -hmm. um, and it's funny because at that time, um, of course, I don't have any rec major recollection of this. So it's mostly what my mom remembers. But she's like, as soon as I started seeing you sway, 
I switched your pediatrician. And as soon as we switched your pediatrician, the new pediatrician said, go get her checked with an MRI. That's when, you know, it's funny because all those years I had it, but you know, psychologically, this mm. may interest you, you know, and you have it. It's like, you have it, then until you're told you have it, you don't really feel it, right? So it's like a placebo effect kind of, yeah. right? Yeah. It's actually really interesting if you think it's about so it. It's so interesting that for within two days, just getting that diagnosis, knowing what the condition is, and you couldn't do that summer salt. Your body right, didn't right. allow it. Like, it happened like overnight, you know? It's like, okay, we have this. Now you're totally, you know, I don't want to say this, but you're like totally inebriated, right? You're totally incapacitated. Mm. So I to switch gears pretty quickly like I was I told you a very robust athlete um I played forward defense and soccer I played softball I played um uh baseball I played basketball I played pretty much all the U.S. sports <laughs> and then all of a sudden you know um saying that okay she's not gonna be she's not gonna be fit to do these things I um so she should find another hobby another pastime so Even I remember you were doing all of those things. Someone told you you wouldn't be able to, and then that realization. Yeah, so I, I was diagnosed, but until the age of 15, I continued all these activities because mm -hmm. it was so like inbuilt in me that, you know, mm -hmm. without running, without playing soccer, what does a child or a teenager do? So um, until I think the age of like 14 ish, I was. Pretty, I pretty much pushed myself to continue, you know, doing the sprints in soccer and um, like trying to hit the ball and trying to, I played catch with my father. I remember, you know, just to keep myself that, uh, believe in myself that, hey, I can do it. You know, nothing is really wrong with me. Then there came a time when um, I st stopped being able to have enough coordination to do any running. So I was pulled out of physical education, which is like in the US, we're given one hour of like physical activities and um, like playing, you know, afterwards or something like that. Um, so that's uh, until age 14 or 15, I pushed myself until, you know, I guess until the glass was totally full and, you know, totally stopped me and said, you can't do it anymore. Yeah. I can so relate to that almost. Mm -hmm. I mean, been been through that myself. Not exactly in sports, but a lot of my hobbies, which I had to eventually stop doing because the body just doesn't permit you. Yeah. Know. What and are some of those hobbies, Madhu? Love dancing. Mm -hmm. So I started dance. I mean, I used to dance. As I said, that being sick was it was pretty since early childhood itself. So even then, like, we are a Bengali family, right? So, you know, dance, singing, these are some things which mm -hmm. is just a part and parcel yeah. of everyday life. Uh, so most often, like, there would be programs happening, even at home, like some celebrations happening. So at that point of time, they would make me do, like, dance in a, you know, sitting and dancing. But eventually, I picked up dancing when I was in fifth or sixth grade. And I was a full-fledged dancer, though I didn't learn dancing uh, officially, uh, but used to do stage shows, programs in schools. You know, even in the locality, we would have mm -hmm. a lot of programs. Like every month, there would be programs that I'm dancing, four or five dances at a stretch. But right when I entered my master's, so slowly my, you know, breathing issues started becoming more evident. Mm -hmm. And there was a point when I couldn't even get up of my bed and go to the next room, right? And that's when I had to drop and stop that, like, kind of forever. So, yeah, it's the same with singing. So, yeah, yeah. because it puts yeah. a lot of pressure on the vocal cord and it mm -hmm. becomes very difficult to continue yeah. for some time. Yeah. yeah. I am hearing both of your stories and 
this is the first time I'm hearing about it so in depth. So, and the only word that keeps coming for me is loss. So yeah. much loss in so many different ways. Not just as an adult, but as a young child. I mean, as adults, probably we have more resources, cognitive understanding. But what do you do when you you're hit with this huge tornado at a young age? So what, what comes up for you as you think about what's been lost for you growing up or even as adults? Um, I think it's um it's definitely harder to be hit with something like this in childhood rather than adulthood for the reason that you just mentioned. Um I would say for me it was devastating. Um after the initial um I think it was uh positivity, I took it with positivity, but then in your teenagers that's that's when it hit me you know that's when I started crying and I started feeling the isolation and I started hearing the you know bully bullying remarks and I started feeling okay why am I different I am different you know what's wrong with me um you, that's I think that's you know because you're I think that's when you start thinking your teenage years that's when you you start developing more of your cognitive abilities. And that's that's the hardest year because that's when everyone looks to you, looks to your similarities rather than your differences. So um so for me it was very devastating when I was diagnosed and not being able to put myself into the activities in which I was growing up with, you know, namely my athletic abilities. Um the hobby that I took up, which turned out to be um, kind of a life savior for me, uh, very cathartic, um, mm -hmm. and uh, was poetry. So mm -hmm. it was, it kind of it fueled itself because I started writing poetry to talk to someone, let out my feelings, and it turned out to be really good. And people said, write more, write more, you know. Um, so then I just, you know, it just kind of fueled itself and it took me off through college. Um, mostly I wrote about my feelings and, you know, how I overcame stuff. And I mean, I think uh, I was have published, I given awards, I was published. I started writing in Spanish, but unfortunately after college, it kind of all melted away um, and kind of you know, was substituted with a more professional life. Mm -hmm. Wow, poetry. I would definitely push you a little to read one out for us sometime whenever you're comfortable. <laughs> yeah, but I think going back to um, your initial observation loss, I think um, that is a very apt observation. And I think anyone with a rare disease or some kind of um, disability or condition is faced with a lot of loss. Um, it's interesting because I was I just did a session with someone and they said like um you lost you lost so much, you know, how does someone at such a young age um deal with like the hurdles that you are challenged with when you don't even have the maturity to understand what really the challenge is. And my response was, you know, at such a young age, I was forced to have that maturity, which only is now um, coming, you know, in handy because I was forced to become so much more mature than so many of my counterparts at such a young age that right now I'm ahead of the game, you know? I can say I'm more mature than them. No, just kidding. I think 20 years, I've my family and I have been running behind cures. Oh, you know, my thought process was always like, okay, let me just do therapy. Let me just focus on improving my balance. Once I'm better, I, I can have a family. Once I'm better, I can have a career. But um, I think about 10 years ago, I realized that's not going to happen. This is my life. 
whether I improve and which um I'm not saying I don't do therapy. I don't I spend almost six hours a day trying to improve my condition. So that's I'm not saying that I've stopped looking for my improvement. But um, my thought has changed a little bit, uh, saying that now I'm going to live after my, after I'm cured, uh, mm -hmm. I'm like hell within. I, I'm going to live now, whether or not I have, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I have a disability, you know, yeah. and now I'm at a place where I can say, oh, okay, let me help the other people who don't have my positivity. You know, maybe I can help them with a better outlook in life. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, Madhu, you also share that in commonality because you work with so many individuals who have rare disease. And yet, what what parts of this word loss resonates with you in your life story? I would, I mean, this is a this is something which is true in everyday life of ours, I would say. Right? I have seen and experienced that myself. I have seen it in the client who I handle, who suffer from rare conditions. So this is a constant. And the saddest part of it, I would say that it's not just one loss, right? Every time it's changing mm -hmm. and you have to constantly cope up with that, right? So for myself, if I, if I have to say, since childhood, you know, some of the major areas that I've lost and, you know, I feel losing for them is childhood in itself, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, and I agree with you. Like, you're just dealing with so much that you you mentally become mature. As Alma said, you have to. You don't have an you option. Have to. Oh, wow. Right? And, you know, as we also commonly say in therapy, that... Uh, a child who has lost being a child, right? How traumatizing it can be emotionally mm -hmm. for them. Yes. And it's just too much. Like I I remember that it was very difficult to play with other kids of my age. Right. Mm -hmm. Nobody would understand what I'm going through. Mm -hmm. uh, their parents wouldn't understand what I'm going through. And you know, being Having a condition which is as rare as like two to three people in one lakh people, no human, layman can have an idea about what that condition is, right? Mm -hmm. The child is frequently falling sick. That is all that they see. Mm -hmm. So as a result, the parent's reaction is also that, okay, let my child not go too close to that child who is not well because they, my child will fall sick. Right. So willingly or unwillingly, you're just isolated from your peer group. You can't attend to school. You can't. I, I have never played a sport in my life. Never. Literally. Wow. Okay. No running at any point of time. Because Do you I, desire to when you watch? I, I wanted to. I, mm -hmm. I did want to, but it just didn't happen. Right. Mm -hmm. So when dance when I started dancing, that was a time when I was really happy because I could do things with my peers. I could enjoy doing things with my peers. Right? When that went off, it was a huge hit. And mm -hmm. it was very difficult to cope up with that. Probably I still grieve on that. And you know, maybe the form of thing that I practice right now is not exactly done. But I did improvise it over the years and do something that just helped me mm -hmm. went out and, you know, make me happy. Yeah. Uh, may not be for a stage show, but I am happy doing that. Yeah. Right? What's that if you don't mind sharing? So, uh, you know, interestingly, uh, one of my physiotherapists, uh, he told me that, you know, Manavita, and he happened to be my colleague as well. So we worked together and these conversations used to happen a lot. So he told me that, Madhu, you know, it's okay if you're not being able to do it for, let's say, 10 minutes at a stretch. Maybe not at a, you know, not at a stage. But 
if you want to do something and if you notice that okay after doing it for 5 minutes you are getting breathless you know your body more than anybody else do even mm-hmm. your doctors do right so when you feel that okay this is something which is getting beyond what i can manage stop at that but why stop the entire activity mm-hmm. okay yeah. so this and i i that really stuck with me somewhere you have to find out you know how do you even con- how do you continue something which gives you happiness but that is a major loss right it is a major and loss push yourself for five more years right it becomes very difficult to let go of those parts of you but sometimes mm-hmm. you need to i have myself had to let go a lot of it sometimes find a way you know something around it which helps you in continuing it in whatever way possible mm-hmm. yeah and i sense that heaven is in your voice as you're saying this i mean it's when does it get easy i don't know and these are such existential questions also like you say sometime we have to let go but what does it mean to let go when you already had to let go so much when you didn't want to that's yeah, yeah. i think i think somia i think um just to extrapolate a little bit to get beyond uh, myself and madhu here it is with madhu and myself and countless others of us that it was snatched from us right but i think everyone that's so different that. to let go and to have something snatched from you but see you didn't have a choice in that mm mm-hmm. we didn't have a choice but also <laughs> see there's two si- two sides of every coin right we're discussing um the pain the loss the grievances you know how hard it was from the other side the amount of resilience mud when i have oh and for sure amount yeah. of resilience we're we're not we don't even it's not even a question of whether we have to it's just thrown at us you know just like things are to knock from us we're also given we're also given the trait of resiliency and we won't overlook that at all and i'm reminded of this thing how when we talk about trauma it's is a lot of pain there's a lot of struggle and and not but and there also lies the seed of authenticity resilience so much in there and they go hand in hand. we can't just talk about the pain and just talk about the rainbows of life they're all mm-hmm. going together yeah yeah so thank you for bringing that up because i am wondering so i also have one more question of when you did get diagnosed with your respective conditions how did the behavior or approach of your family and the immediate loved ones change towards you if by any chance and why i'm asking that question is a few of my clients who live with certain conditions and have been diagnosed since childhood the two things that they talk about are one how they have to do so much more just to reach a state of normalcy right just to get that yes, yes, yes. Oh, zoom sent some confetti over me <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah 